Good evening, friends. I'm Vitaly Kolpashnikov. Allow me to introduce you. It's currently 8.12 p.m. Moscow time on June 4, 2023, Sunday, summer. I'm Vitaly Kolpashnikov, and joining us on the broadcast is Leonid Vasilyevich Konovalov. He is a graduate of the Gerasimov Institute of Cinematography, a.k.a. Geek, a cinematographer, a longtime geek teacher, a teacher at the Moscow Film School, at the private film school Lesnitsa, and also an expert on the NASA Apollo program, correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Well then, let's get acquainted, Leonid. We already have over 60 people watching. I can tell our viewers that during the broadcast, you can ask questions. But first, Leonid will tell us a little bit about himself. Leonid, I have a tradition on my broadcasts. Our newcomers, those who are joining my show for the first time, usually tell my subscribers a bit about themselves. I assume that some of those who are currently here, watching online, may have heard about you or know about you, but I suspect that some may not have. So, for those who don't know you, could you briefly introduce yourself? If I had to describe it briefly, then, sure, I can share some interesting facts. For example, as a cinematographer, I worked on a documentary film called, The Beloves. The director was Viktor Kosakovsky. This film received a state award, which is the highest recognition in our country. I have worked on various TV series, both fictional and documentary films. I also filmed a documentary in Cuba with the director Vitaly Monsky. I have been teaching at Geek for 30 years. For 28 years, I taught courses on cinematic processes and film materials until the film processes were completely finished. I have been teaching theory and practice of film editing for approximately 20 years. I have also taught at the Moscow Film School. At one point, I developed several films with non-standard color rendering at the Svema manufacturer of the photographic film. I can say that it's a unique case in the world for a person to come up with their own films. They were called, Retro. So, Leonid, what happened next? I worked in the postgraduate department of the Cinema and Photo Research Institute, Geek. Later, I was invited several times as an expert on the show, Postscriptum, with Alexei Pushkov, a member of the Russian parliament. For about 12 or 13 years, I have actively been involved in the moon hoax investigation because the whole story of the moon landings is just a fabrication. It's all cinematic tricks. And as a cinematographer, I can perfectly see it through. Many people don't understand how it was done. I say, let me tell you in detail what it is. What you see here is not a human, not an astronaut. It's just an ordinary doll. And you all think it's a person. For example, this is a stationary mannequin. It's not an astronaut. It's not Buzz Aldrin. It's a stationary mannequin weighing 22 kilograms. And so on. As a cinematographer and someone who works extensively with imagery, I understand perfectly well what technologies were employed. For over two years, two and a half years to be precise, I have been running a channel on Yandex Zen called, The Cinematographer Explains. At the moment, I have written 205 articles, and almost all of them are dedicated to exposing the moon hoax. I explain the techniques used in different missions. And, of course, I emphasize the cinematic essence of these techniques. Let's start in chronological order. The year is 1969, the American Moon Program, Apollo 11 mission. What we saw in the footage with Armstrong and other American astronauts, was it filmed by Stanley Kubrick somewhere in Nevada or elsewhere? The thing is, when we talk about 1969, we must understand that what was shown on television was a movie. 
and a movie has a certain production timeline. Therefore, the premiere was set for July 16, the launch of the Saturn V carrier rocket with Apollo 11 spacecraft. The filming took place several years before that. For example, there is a Hollywood film playing in theaters right now. You look it up on the internet, and it turns out the filming started two years ago. The same goes for the Kubrick's involvement. There is a photograph from 1965 that I can show you, where NASA employees are seen together with Kubrick. To be honest, three candidates were considered. Besides Kubrick, for example, there was the director who made, Some Like It Hot, Billy Wilder. They settled on Kubrick. And, regardless of the location, it might not have been filmed in Nevada but possibly somewhere near London, in the United Kingdom. But the fact is unequivocal. It was not filmed in 1969 but several years before that. And two years before the mission no one knew who would actually go. For example, that it would be Armstrong. The decision that Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins would go was made three months prior. Therefore, you won't see any faces in any of the lunar photographs because, in reality, different actors played the Armstrong's role. If you look closely, you'll notice that these actors were about 30 to 40 centimeters shorter than the Hollywood actors Armstrong and Aldrin. Here, for example, I'll show you a photograph. American astronauts were very tall. Armstrong, for example, was 5 feet 11 inches or 1 meter 80 centimeters. But, on the other hand, our cosmonauts were noticeably shorter. Yuri Gagarin was 1 meter 65 centimeters or 5 feet 4 inches, and Alexei Leonov was around 1 meter 63 centimeters or 5 feet 3 inches. Everyone understood that there was very little space inside the spacecraft, inside the return capsule. So they selected cosmonauts of shorter stature. In contrast, American astronauts were very tall. And here, I want to show you this. Look, for example, here a NASA employee is showing a ladder, and a flag case is attached to the side. You can see that the top of the flag is at the height of his head. And this is a live broadcast from the moon. Maybe it's not clear here. The top of the flag is here, and the astronaut is significantly lower. It is known that the distance between the steps of the ladder the astronaut descends is 9 inches. And if we measure the height of the astronaut from the top of the helmet to the heel, it turns out that this astronaut is about 55 centimeters shorter than Armstrong. Here is a photograph of Armstrong on training on this ladder. I've aligned them so that the steps match. And we can see that the lunar astronaut, aligning them by the top of the helmet, at the bottom it only reaches the knee. In other words, the actor who played Armstrong in the moon footage, in the most famous shots, was approximately 55 centimeters shorter when considering Armstrong's height with the helmet and those lunar boots. So, Armstrong and Aldrin were played by completely different actors, dwarfs. Furthermore, according to some calculations, a very strange picture emerges. For example, there is a well-known photograph where an astronaut is going through the hatch of the lunar module, and the width of the hatch is known to be 81 centimeters. Then it turns out that this life support backpack is only 40 centimeters wide. And when we transfer it to the photograph, 
It turns out that the height of this astronaut is 1 meter 32 centimeters or 4 feet 3 inches. But it should be 5 feet 11 inches plus the helmet aquarium, plus the boots with heels, plus the lunar boots. It should be a height of around 1 meter 95 centimeters or 6 feet 5 inches. But here it is 4 feet 3 inches. In other words, this mannequin, and most likely it was a mannequin, was about half a meter shorter than the well-known Hollywood actors Armstrong and Aldrin. They didn't fly anywhere. They were simply selected. I think it was purely based on appearance. They needed a Hollywood smile. No one went to the moon and was not going to fly anywhere, not to any moon. It wasn't even planned. The Americans didn't have anything for that. By the way, speaking of the use of dwarfs, I want to show you this picture. You've probably seen this movie, you know, right? Frodo? You know? Frodo? Yes, yes. Oh, is it The Lord of the Rings? Yes, yes, the trilogy. And here, to show that some people were taller and others shorter, doubles were used. Among the doubles, there were dwarfs. The use of dwarfs in movies is quite common. I don't see anything particularly special here. But to summarize, it can be said that in 1969 the Americans had nothing to fly into space. They didn't have spacesuits for the moon. Furthermore, these spacesuits still don't exist. They have been trying to develop a lunar spacesuit for 10 years now, and still, nothing. Enormous amounts of money have been spent, and there are still no lunar spacesuits. And what was supposedly used on the moon in 1969 to 1972 was just ordinary props. For example, according to the Encyclopedia Astronautica, the weight of this spacesuit is about 54 kilograms. But according to Alexeyev's book, Spacesuits, Yesterday, Today, Tomorrow, they weighed just 48 kilograms. And we know that currently, on the International Space Station, the EVA spacesuits worn by those who go outside the station, weigh 120 kilograms. The American one weighs even more, 150 kilograms. That's why they are urgently rewriting the weight of the Apollo 11 spacesuit on Wikipedia, saying that it was not 48 or 54 kilograms but 91 kilograms, just to make it somewhat closer to reality. So, in those years, they just made this kind of lightweight spacesuit, similar to the one Sandra Bullock wore in the movie, Gravity, like an Adidas tracksuit, and called it a spacesuit. That's why they ended up without spacesuits. They didn't have, and still don't have a carrier rocket capable of lifting about 140 tons into low Earth orbit. They don't have a module that could land on the moon and take off. Because if you look at the modules they used in the moon missions and look at the photos on NASA's official website, it's just a reason to make fun and laugh. These are photos from the official website. This is just some crumpled aluminum foil. It's all so fake, with all these gaps. They didn't have anything. Someone may ask why, for example, I believe that there wasn't even a launch vehicle that took off. After all, everyone will say, how is that possible? We saw it. Half the world saw it live, the launch of Apollo 11. But in reality, it is reliably known that Apollo 11 reached a height of just over 14 kilometers. After that, it simply fell into the Atlantic Ocean. It didn't even reach an altitude of 30 kilometers.
It couldn't go higher because it was a fake rocket. It was a mock-up. Only the first stage was operational. All the other stages were empty dummies. The thing is, this launch vehicle is now in a museum, and it has five powerful F-1 engines. The rocket itself weighs 3,000 tons. This entire gigantic rocket weighs 3,000 tons. And to lift this rocket and send it somewhere into space, five powerful engines were used. If we look at these engines, we divide 3,000 tons by five. Each engine had to have a thrust of 600 tons. There are five combustion chambers and each of them should lift 600 tons. If it's less, the rocket won't launch at all. According to NASA's fable, the thrust of these engines was 690 tons per combustion chamber. So what's the matter? The most modern powerful engines, for example, those Russian ones, have a thrust of no more than 200 ton force per combustion chamber. Therefore, if we look at the official history of the development of kerosene engines, I emphasize kerosene engines. We see a line suddenly rising to 690 for F1. And then all these engines that are currently used in the US, like the Merlin, have a thrust of less than 90 ton force. The F1 engine was a fictitious engine, it really didn't exist. The claimed thrust of 690 tons was not there. Oxygen kerosene engines do not provide such thrust in reality. We understood this in the Soviet Union. That's why instead of five super-duper powerful engines on our N1 rocket, our national rocket that was being prepared for launch had 30 engines. You see, here in the center and around it, there was a problem with synchronizing these engines. So what's the issue? Now the Americans have abandoned their idea of super powerful engines because it's impossible to create them in principle. For example, let's take Falcon Super Heavy which has 27 engines. There was an attempt to launch the Starship to the Moon. It had 30 engines. So these engines were on Apollo 11, and the launch vehicle was called Saturn V. Apollo 11 was the spacecraft that was on top. It's essentially fiction that cannot be achieved even today. And if we start examining the design of the spacecraft, we will see that this is impossible to create in reality. In essence, only the first stage of Saturn V was operational. And instead of the second stage, there was only a coil in the center like this. It can be seen in the assembly. And there was stage casing. The second and third stages had just stage skin, and an empty coil was inside. So the second and third stages were empty. It wasn't even planned for this rocket to reach low Earth orbit. But it took off, went up a little bit, and that's it. And the most interesting thing is that there is a video footage of the launch of Apollo 11. And all that was shot on film, completely contradicts NASA's official version. If we analyze these amateur videos filmed by enthusiasts during the launch of Apollo 11, we will see that the rocket's speed and altitude do not correspond at all to the data provided by NASA. So, 
This rocket gained neither speed, nor required altitude. In particular, there are at least four videos where Apollo 11 is seen piercing semi-transparent clouds as it passes through them. On the day of the launch, July 16, 1969, there was semi-transparent cloud cover of cirrus clouds. When the rocket passed through these clouds, it cast a shadow on them. These clouds were at an altitude of approximately 8 kilometers, and it took 106 seconds for the rocket to reach that altitude. So, what does this mean? Theoretically, after 106 seconds, the rocket should have been at an altitude of 24 kilometers. But in reality, it only reached the upper layer of clouds at 8 kilometers. It means that it did not gain any altitude or speed. Next, another aspect visible in Apollo 11 is the presence of a contrail. You probably know that an aircraft leaves behind a contrail. It forms in the tropopause, at an altitude ranging from 12 to 14 kilometers, depending on the latitude. During Apollo 11 mission, a contrail was also observed trailing behind it. It appeared at the 140th second. At the 140th second, Apollo should theoretically have been at an altitude of 47 kilometers. However, it only reached the tropopause, approximately 14 kilometers. And then Apollo 11 descended. That's it. It did not go anywhere. It reached a maximum altitude of slightly above 14 kilometers, maybe up to 30 kilometers due to inertia. Then it fell into the Atlantic Ocean. To make it less noticeable, they burned it. Another interesting point is that the spectators should not suspect anything. The launch, as you know, directs towards the east. The Earth rotates from west to east, which makes it seem like the sun is moving from east to west. Therefore, to take advantage of the Earth's rotation and add additional velocity to the rocket, launches are always conducted towards the east. In the east, the sun has already risen in the morning. So, all the spectators gather and watch. The sun has already risen at 9 o'clock in the morning. Apollo 11 is being prepared for launch. Everyone stands and looks directly at the sun. The rocket launches next to the sun. That's why no spectator properly saw anything. And the Americans came up with this trick. When the first stage is flying, you see flames and a stream of burning gases. They claimed that the second stage was fueled by hydrogen, and the flames were invisible. Therefore, they say, you couldn't see it. The rocket moved away, and you couldn't see it. So, there was nothing there. That's why I firmly believe that these Apollo rockets did not go higher than 30 kilometers up. So, no one was planning anything real. There were no powerful engines. If you look at the design of all these, I apologize. Here, for example, there was the lunar module, and it was covered with a fairing. The fairing had four pedals, and the Apollo spacecraft, weighing 32 tons, stood on these four pedals. So, it was a poorly designed structure in general. Ask your questions because everything we see in the moon landings, the dockings, it's all just ordinary movie tricks. For example, all those moonwalks, running on the surface of the moon, it's all Hollywooding, so to speak, and nothing more. There's nothing there that resembles the moonscape at all. Leonid, now we will have questions. I have many questions in my private messages and comments. Okay, let's begin. Let's start with questions from the audience. 
Now someone completely unknown to me from St. Petersburg will ask you questions. Alexander from St. Petersburg. Hello. Hello. I agree. We are not acquainted. It's the first time I hear about you. I have a question about the Soviet space program. Can I ask a question? Or are you only an expert on the American program? You see, I am a cameraman. I can judge based on certain external signs. I do look into, for example, the Soviet program. I write in great detail, for example, about how the filming of the dark side of the moon was conducted. I couldn't find it anywhere on the internet, so I published it myself. Let me ask your opinion. Are you aware? There is an opinion that Gagarin and Seryagin flew abroad. And Gagarin didn't crash in the accident where he was declared dead. That's the first question. Personally, I don't believe it much and I am categorically against such a framing of the question. And the second point. I saw a video by a Soviet scientist. Unfortunately, I don't have his full name. He claims that in the Soviet Union, in the lunar programs Luna 1, Luna 2, Luna 10, Luna 12, only somewhere around the 10th attempt did they manage to reach the moon. All the other attempts resulted in the spacecraft flying so far off course that all the mathematical laws by which it was launched simply didn't work. So, these are two questions about Gagarin and the Soviet moon. Thank you. You know, of course, there are many speculations. For many years I communicated with Boris Smirnov. He was the head of the cinematography department at Vgeek, and I worked at that department. Boris Smirnov was the person who taught Gagarin how to handle a camera and a movie camera. He was the head of the photo laboratory. So, regarding Gagarin, he told me that there were no such stories about Gagarin flying abroad. He told me the intricacies of how everything was going on. There is even a documentary film where he explains in detail that even the word cosmonaut was prohibited. It was classified. So, everyone was called a student. Therefore, as for Gagarin flying abroad, I think it doesn't fit the facts at all. It's not even clear what basis all of this is based on. And what was the second question? I forgot. About the Soviet moon program that we reached the moon from the 10th attempt. Ah, yes, look. You see, here's the thing. To launch a satellite or any spacecraft towards the moon, we started doing that in 1959. And it was in early January 1959. So, just two years had passed since the launch of the first satellite. And after two years, we launched a spacecraft towards the moon. It flew at a distance of about 5,000 kilometers. The thing is, in order to overcome the Earth's gravity, it travels at a speed of 11 kilometers per second. As it gradually starts to be attracted to the Earth, the speed decreases. But when the moon catches it with its gravity, it accelerates and crashes into the moon. So, we had a second Luna, a second spacecraft that hit the moon approximately in the middle at a speed of 3 kilometers per second. So, the difficulty is not just about reaching the moon, but also periodically adjusting the orbit. And it's necessary to process a large amount of information. With a flight speed of 3 kilometers per second, it's not surprising that it was difficult to accurately calculate the trajectory. And certainly, we had unsuccessful landings as well. The first soft landing happened only in 1966. You understand, right? It took us six or almost seven years to land softly on the moon. Because when landing on the moon, we need to reduce the speed from three kilometers per second almost to zero.
And that's why only in 1966, after seven years from the launch of the first spacecraft towards the moon, Luna 9 managed to achieve a soft landing. Therefore, these spacecraft that were sent to the moon were relatively lightweight. But when we talk about the American lunar module, it weighs about 15 tons, makes sense? And to land 15 tons on the moon is an extremely challenging task. Currently, the Americans are thinking about how to design a lunar module that can land on the moon and take off. But only now the development of such a lunar module has begun. So, what the Americans proposed in 1969 was purely in the realm of science fiction. It was not well thought out from a theoretical, economic, or energy perspective. It was simply a facade. Thank you for the question, Alexander. Does anyone else want to ask a question to our specialist? Are there any other interested individuals? Let me initiate by sharing some information. Maybe questions will arise. There are questions. I have many questions. Actually, I just asked a question. I have plenty of questions for you, though. I have many questions in the comments. Here's an interesting question from Maxime. Leonid, please tell us, did the deception by the Americans regarding the moon landings affect the psychological and emotional state of the astronauts involved in this hoax? There were many people involved in supporting and servicing the missions, including the astronauts themselves. Were there any cases where they experienced stress, depression, or alcohol-induced revelations of the truth? I think they were afraid to reveal the truth because because they had witnessed the Apollo 1 incident, where three astronauts burned to death inside the capsule on Earth. The atmosphere inside was pure oxygen, and when a spark occurred, everything inside ignited. The hatches were sealed shut, making them impossible to open, and the three astronauts burned alive. So, they had an example before their eyes of what would happen if they deviated from the plan or said something wrong. However, we should consider one simple thing. These astronauts were being prepared for the falsification long before Apollo, several years in advance. Armstrong initially flew in two-seater Gemini spacecraft, and even that Gemini mission was a fabrication. I used to think that the Americans first reached Earth orbit in 1968. Now I am more inclined to believe that the Americans were able to replicate Yuri Gagarin's flight only 20 years later, in 1981, on April 12. They call that day, April 12, 1981, the day of cosmonautics when the first shuttle Columbia was launched. So, I believe that they actually achieved Earth orbit for the first time 20 years later, in 1981. Therefore, all these missions, the single-seater Mercury, the two-seater Gemini, and the three-seater Apollo, were essentially alternative flights. Such flights are called suborbital. The spacecraft takes off, reaches an altitude of over 100 kilometers, up to 200 kilometers, and then falls into the Atlantic Ocean. It doesn't reach the necessary speed of 7.9 kilometers per second to orbit the Earth. It reaches a maximum speed of about 2.5 kilometers per second and therefore, it inevitably falls into the ocean. I believe that the astronauts experienced tremendous stress. For example, after the Apollo 11 mission, a month passed, and the press conference with Aldrin, Collins, and Armstrong took place. If you watch that press conference, how it starts, they begin shuffling papers, rubbing their fingers, fidgeting in their seats. It is evident that they are very uncomfortable. They don't resemble winners at all. 
As one user commented on that video, I've seen happier guys at a funeral. I believe that they were under significant psychological stress. In subsequent years, they had tried not to talk about it, not to go anywhere, and especially not to draw attention to themselves. I think they experienced a great deal of intense stress. Perhaps deep down, they hoped that eventually they would actually fly. But I think they were being prepared long before Apollo 11. They specifically selected people from military pilots. Before Apollo, there were the two-seater Gemini missions. It was a small, cramped capsule with no facilities, not even a toilet, and they would sit motionless there allegedly for two weeks. One of the Gemini missions lasted two weeks in space. Therefore, I believe they all experienced tremendous stress, and people were being selected over many years. As for those who tried to say something or inadvertently revealed something, they were either strongly hinted at, blackmailed, or simply physically eliminated. That's my opinion. In any case, the deaths of the three Apollo 1 crew members seem very, very suspicious, not entirely natural. It gives the impression that the same people who killed Kennedy were behind all of this. It's all full of mystery. But there's no mystery with Kennedy, it's elementary. Can we have a broadcast about Kennedy's assassination? That's not my area of expertise. No, better ask questions about the moon. For example, the famous drives in the electric car. The electric car is driving on the moon. In reality, there's a doll sitting there. I'd be happy to tell you something that no one else will tell you. It's a 30-centimeter doll sitting on a remote-controlled model. Its arm is suspended all the time. The background is added to create a sense of a distant moonscape. So, I'd rather tell you things others won't tell you. What methods were used to create the background? What was Kubrick's role? He came up with projecting a 30-meter image of the lunar mountain onto a cinema screen for that background, using a large projector. For example, when we look at these photographs, the astronaut is standing in front of a cinema screen. The distance to the screen is approximately 26 to 30 meters. The dark bulk soil is in front on a platform, and a mannequin is standing there. No one will tell you that it's not a person, but a mannequin. These mannequins were used to take photographs from different angles, with a slight difference. Because if you invite a real person, they can't stand still for a whole day, but a mannequin can. So, they took the shots, developed them, and checked. Everything was fine, so they took another series of shots. But a real person wants to smoke or use the restroom, they will leave extra footprints. And they didn't want any footprints or sand disturbance. So, they came up with a simple solution. They used mannequins, and there is a mountain behind them. What Kubrick specifically worked on was the projection, how to project that mountain onto the screen. In reality, there was a cinema screen. This part was built in a studio, and the image of the lunar mountain was projected onto the cinema screen. We replicated this technology on the Zvezda TV channel. Here, you see, I'm in the spacesuit. Behind me is a cinema screen. The projector is currently off. 
But here, the projector is on, and the lunar mountain appears in the background. So, I had better tell you about the methods of creating lunar photographs. That's my area of expertise. Can I read a question? Please go ahead. I'm not very knowledgeable in the technical aspects, so I'll read the question in full. The retro reflector, which was even used by our Crimean Observatory, was brought to the moon by the Americans. The Japanese, Chinese, and Indians took pictures of the abandoned rover exactly where it was marked by the Americans. If the Americans didn't go, then none of the nine missions took place, six landings, two with operations in lunar orbit before the first landing, and one emergency mission. And nobody seems to have been caught? Let's touch upon the question. Firstly, let's address the question about the Japanese and others. I just wanted to show you what these photos taken on the moon look like the ones that supposedly the Japanese or Chinese were able to replicate. Well, first of all, the Americans always believed that the lunar soil was completely gray, and they took photos with completely gray soil. But then, especially after 2013 when the Chinese space mission took place, the Chinese rover landed, and it turned out that the moon was brown. This is roughly how the color really looks up close. This is approximately how the moon looks. And now the Americans are repainting all their photos in brown. Previously, they always brought and showed lunar rocks in a completely gray color in the photographs. So, if you go to the NASA website, for example, I took it from the NASA website, you see the surface of the moon, and in the background, there's a small lunar module. Now they rescanned it, and this lunar module is moving against the backdrop of an intense brown moon. So, the Americans got the color of the moon wrong, and now they are repainting it. Now, what did foreigners see? I'll show you what the Chinese saw. This is Chang'e 2. Look at the photo of the lunar rover sent by the Chinese. Do you see anything here? They say, look, here is our American picture. Here are allegedly the tracks of the rover. And look, the Chinese completely replicated it. If you look closely, you'll see it's just a blurry spot. So, to say that the Chinese discovered the rover, it's quite a stretch. I don't see anything here except for a small dark spot on a gray background. Now let's move on to the Indians. At some conference, a photo was shown. The landing platform casts a shadow, and they say, look, this is an exact match to the American photo. So, India proved it. The Indian probe that orbits the moon proves that this is the landing site. But we know that the Indians don't have their own powerful radio telescopes. So they receive all the information through American radio telescopes. This photo which they published two or three years ago, is actually an American photo taken in 2009. It's an exact match, with the same shadow cast in the same direction. It's as if an American probe was flying there in 2009 and taking pictures of the lunar surface. And the Indian photo is an exact replica of it. So, I am absolutely convinced that this is not an Indian image, but they were given an American one and were told to show this. 
That's why I am very skeptical about the idea that the Japanese, Chinese, or India have photographed the landing site. If you carefully investigate, you will see that such photos simply do not exist. I am also skeptical when it comes to the claim that in the Soviet Union we monitored the Apollo 11 mission and saw them land. There are such articles in our magazines, and you can find them on the internet. However, the question arises. Even our cosmonauts Georgi Grechko and Alexei Leonov say that we received signals directly from the Moon. Let's see what actually happened. Our radio telescope is located in Crimea, and when the Moon is above the United States and signals are transmitted, our radio telescope cannot receive those signals. In other words, when there was a live broadcast from the Moon and signal transmission, the Moon was not visible from the territory of the USSR. Similarly, when the sun is shining here, it is night time in America, or when the moon is above the United States, it cannot be seen from Crimea or any other point in the Soviet Union, especially in Crimea. When they say, we received signals from Apollo 11 on our radio telescope in Crimea, we could not receive any signals through the Earth because the Moon was over here, and the telescope was directed over there. Only after three to four hours, when the live broadcast ended, the Moon rose above the horizon, and we were able to see it. Therefore, we did not receive any signals. I am told in response that besides the radio telescope in Crimea, there were also ships of the Academy of Sciences. For example, the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, or the academician Sergei Korolyov. But these ships were completed in 1971 and could not receive anything from the American Apollo. If you go to Yandex Zen, I explain in detail what kind of signal the Americans sent to Earth. It turns out that the format of this signal was such that we simply could not decipher it. We did not have such equipment. For example, as a cinematographer, I explain in detail how the video signal was encoded. From the moon, the camera transmitted 10 frames per second. But the Americans transmitted a unified S-band signal. So they transmitted audio commands, telemetry, health status, data from all sensors through a single channel. Even if we had received this signal, even the television signal, and managed to extract it from this mixture, we still would not have been able to see anything, because it was encoded in such a tricky format. And to decipher this format, the Americans came up with various special timers to convert 10 frames per second, which is a non-standard FPS for television, into NTSC 60 frames per second. That's why they had a special disc recorder that duplicated frames, turning 10 frames into 60 half frames, and so on. We simply did not have such equipment at all. Therefore, we could not even monitor the Apollo missions, and even if hypothetically we had received a signal from the moon, we would definitely not have been able to decipher it. So, I believe that we did not track them. And all these talks about other countries seeing it, I think, upon closer examination, turn out to be unreliable. As for retro reflectors, there are plenty of articles. You see, retro reflectors can indeed be located only from one specific lunohode. But in reality, these retro reflectors are of little use. On different TV shows, they show us how they direct a beam of light through a telescope. But the thing is, when a ranging signal is sent to the moon, for example, when we direct it through a telescope, it diverges, 
and on the moon, it forms a spot with a diameter of 15 kilometers. Now imagine, the diameter of the spot that reached the moon is 15 kilometers, and somewhere there is a small retro reflector. And from that reflector, only one single photon returns to Earth. It's not like a mirror. It's such a weak signal that it is impossible to distinguish. There are articles about laser ranging. Firstly, lunar laser ranging was carried out several years before the retro reflectors experiment. You can read about it in a Wikipedia article. Therefore, there is no fundamental difference whether the signal is reflected from the lunar surface or from a retro reflector. You see, this spot with a diameter of 15 kilometers is so large that a small retro reflector won't make a significant difference. Only one photon will be reflected. What did that one photon reflect from? It is unclear whether it was reflected from the retro reflector or whether it is the result of surface reflection. A single photon. That's why several bombardments are needed to capture at least five to six photons. All the people think that a laser retro reflector is like a shining mirror. This is true when the distance is close. But when it's 380,000 or 400,000, the moon is moving away at 400,000 or even 405,000 kilometers, then the effect of that retro reflector is very small. Therefore, I have read the articles that inspire confidence that only one of the lunohods has a retro reflector that can be located. And when they show Mythbusters sending a laser beam, it's just a TV show they made and aired. There is nothing reliable there. There is no such huge peak. We are talking about a single photon and distinguishing a single photon after several bombardments. That's why I have such an opinion. A question from the audience from our respected viewer. Can lunar soil be considered an infinite source of nuclear fuel? I don't know about that. Why would lunar soil suddenly become an infinite source of energy? We're not talking about that. We're talking about some hypothetical things, like the production of helium-3 on the moon. Maybe in 300 or 500 years, there might actually be a base on the moon. But for now, you see, there is lunar soil. Let's say, there are meteorites that have fallen from the moon. For example, an American expedition was organized to Antarctica. And since there is snow in Antarctica, if there is a rock lying on top of the snow, then it is clear where it could come from, in the form of a meteorite. So, how can basalt be a source of nuclear fuel? No, nothing like that can happen. I believe that there is absolutely nothing special or tricky about this lunar soil for the nuclear industry. But regarding this question, it's better to discuss it with lunar soil specialists. I can only say one thing about lunar soil. Based on all the spectral characteristics, which can be easily measured through any telescope, and the same information you can find in the book Lunar Soil from the Sea of Fertility, the spectral curve of lunar soil always goes up in the visible range. Meaning, there are fewer blue rays, more green rays, and even more red rays. So, lunar soil itself is brown. The Americans didn't know this. And in all the photographs in the studio, they made the lunar soil gray, as if it were volcanic ash. That's why they failed in every aspect. I also want to say something more about lunar soil. The Americans claim, we brought back 382 kilograms of lunar soil. We handed over, I believe, 32 grams of lunar soil to the Americans. And in return, they gave us, I think, 29 grams.
So, when you ask our academicians, who studied the lunar soil, who researched the American lunar soil in the Soviet Union, Eric Galimov answered on the phone. And this interview appeared on Alexei Pushkov's show, Postscriptum. Alexei Pushkov is a member of the Russian parliament, State Duma. When Galimov was asked, who in the USSR studied the lunar soil from the USA? Who held it in their hands? He replied, I don't know, I'm not aware, I wasn't inquiring. Personally, I studied the soil from the Soviet robotic probe Luna 16. That is, in the Soviet Union or in Russia, it is impossible to find at least one person who held or saw American soil. Then they ask, but how do you refer to American soil and its characteristics in your studies? We have a lot of published studies. They simply answer, we merely publish our own study and take a reference from an American scientific work, saying, look, we are referring to the Americans, but they refer to it, and no one held American soil in their hands. That's why many interesting discoveries were made in the Soviet soil. An inoxidizable iron film and other very interesting things were discovered in our samples of lunar soil. 300 grams of lunar soil or regolith were brought back by three R expeditions. Luna 16, Luna 20, Luna 24. The Americans say, we brought back bedrocks, i.e. moonstones. No one has seen them. And when recently there were attempts made to study these rocks, they say, we hid them in storage for future generations. We are currently providing them for research. But when requests to study are made, they don't give them to anyone. They give them as gifts, but they pour them with epoxy resin so that no one can analyze them. That's why we have a sample of Apollo 11 lunar soil in the Museum of Cosmonautics at the Exhibition of Achievements of National Economy. These are a few grains embedded in a sphere of epoxy resin. No one will break the souvenir out of this epoxy resin sphere. No one will perform a chemical analysis, so it's like a souvenir, and what's really inside is unknown. And you know, some articles have recently been published stating that when they started to study the Apollo 14 lunar soil, it turned out to be of terrestrial origin. And then the Americans came up with the version that this meteorite fell from the moon to Earth, hit the Earth, flew back to the moon, and the Apollo 14 mission retrieved this meteorite. It's as if it made a round trip, you know? It's absolutely incredible. Meteorites fall, yes? They fall. But for it to hit the Earth, gain a velocity of 11 kilometers per second again, and fly back to the Moon, well, that's completely in the realm of unscientific science, fiction. In my opinion, the Americans don't have any soil. Maybe they have some 30 grams, I don't know, no more. But there are no quantities measured in kilograms. That's what they show, some gray boulders. They should actually be a different color, like lunar soil. You know what lunar soil looks like? It resembles the crust of black bread or a brown briefcase. They are similar in color. But the Americans have some gray stuff, completely unlike what it should actually be. And that's how I can answer. Let's continue with the questions. Does anyone want to ask a question to our esteemed expert online? Did the Chinese go to the moon? There were robotic lunar rovers, indeed. Other countries attempted it as well. Israel, for example, crashed during the landing, quite recently, maybe a year ago. Even just landing on the moon without crashing the spacecraft is very difficult. The Americans also tried. Pioneers flew past the moon. The surveyors. One crashed, another hopped, and finally, one remained.
It's very challenging to even reach the moon, especially in those years when there were no computers that could adjust the trajectory, apply impulses for course corrections. That's why it's very complex. And if we look, for example, at the takeoff from the moon, as if the Americans visited the moon and then decided to return. If we observe how a robotic probe took off from the moon, the one that returned a sample of lunar soil, we see a torus below with an opening inside. Our probe, Luna 16, collected a soil sample. And before taking off, the ignition is activated. First, the jet of burning gases must stabilize. It takes five to six seconds, and then lift off. The height from this platform to the moon's surface was about 1 meter 30. But the Americans had nothing on their lunar module. It was a flat surface. Here was a flat surface. We know that when a rocket takes off, there must be always a gas escape channel at the bottom. We have seen this channel. But the Americans didn't have anything like that on the moon. Their lunar module was just some prop for the movie. There was nothing real there. Personally, I have a question. Why did the Americans organize this show? What was the purpose of all this? One can ask a similar question about sports. Why do people participate in the Olympic Games? Because it is a matter of national prestige. Just winning the 100-meter sprint or the breaststroke swimming is very prestigious. And here the prestige of an entire nation is at stake. Americans are known for engaging in state-level falsification for nearly 125 years. They, for example, couldn't achieve many things. I wrote an article and calculated how many years Americans lag behind us in the space industry. It turns out that in some areas, it's approximately 50 years. And in others, it's 20 years. For example, a 20-year lag. Alexei Leonov conducted the very first spacewalk in March 1965. The Americans say, we also walked after two and a half months. I watched that video and wrote nine articles proving that the spacewalk was filmed in a studio. They say, we conducted EVA on Apollo during the coasting to the moon in cislunar space. I watched that video, and I can show it to you. It's a very funny video. How did they film it? Here's a cylinder, an astronaut stands here. They hung him on a rope and started lifting him up. He grips the edge with his hands as he rises up on the rope. Then the camera is turned 90 degrees. So, he appears to be floating, gradually moving above the edge. A 1930s technique. This is how they filmed Zero G in 1930. Americans say, we performed a spacewalk. We caught up with the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union launched the first satellite, it was such a blow to the United States. Sure, it was a shock. And then, when the first cosmonaut, the first woman in space, first spacewalk followed, in order to look worthy in the eyes of the world community, the Americans decided to make everything by using cinematic means. That's why the Americans performed their first spacewalk only in 1983, 18 years after the Soviet Union. Prior to that, if you analyze the photos and videos of their spacewalks, it's like a movie from the 1930s. It's naive. In 1949, they made a movie called Destination Moon. In 1949, Zero G was filmed like that. And in 1969, they filmed Zero G in the exact same way. 
So, in this field, they lagged behind by approximately 18 years. And now, when it's November 2022, how much time has passed? Six months ago, they launched the Artemis mission to the moon. And only now have they realized that when returning from the moon, they need to re-enter Earth's atmosphere differently than they had believed for the past 50 years. When you throw a stone upwards, no matter how fast you throw it, it loses its vertical velocity at the top and starts falling down, returning to Earth at the same speed. To fly to the moon, you need to reach a speed of 11 kilometers per second. When a spacecraft returns from the moon, it approaches Earth at a speed of 11 kilometers per second. In those Apollo missions, Americans claim that they returned from the moon at escape velocity of 11 kilometers per second, practically plummeting into the atmosphere. But the accelerations would be between 15 and 25 g. A man would die. In 1968, we launched the Zond probe around the moon with turtles on board. We were the first to send two turtles on our Zond spacecraft around the moon in 1968-1969. And we understood that when the Zond returned, entering the atmosphere at a speed of 11 kilometers per second would be equivalent to certain death. Therefore, to re-enter atmosphere we used a technique called skip re-entry. First, the spacecraft entered the upper layers of the atmosphere, then exited, slowed down in the upper layers, and re-entered during the second skip when the speed was less than 8 km per second. The Americans were only able to replicate this skip re-entry maneuver in December of last year. We did it in 1968, in 1969. And when did they do it? Only in 2022. How many years have they lagged behind us? 53 years. So, they have fallen far behind us. And all these attempts to return to the moon, to orbit the moon, it's just advertising. Firstly, they still don't have a carrier rocket with the necessary payload capacity. Even the acclaimed Starship by Elon Musk, which was launched on April 20, flew for three minutes and exploded after four minutes. Its actual payload capacity was around 30 tons, although they promote it as 100 tons. Interestingly, this Starship had a similar design as our Soviet rocket in 1972 with about 30 engines in a circle and in the center. But in April, five engines of the Starship didn't work. It started spinning and it exploded. So, their big rocket can't even detach from Earth and reach an altitude higher than 30 kilometers. How did they do it in 1969? It was all just a facade. The rocket was half empty, it was lightweight. And it only reached an altitude of 20 kilometers. It didn't even reach 30 kilometers. So, it's all movie making, all a facade, and so on. And when we start examining different details, like the spacecraft docking and the footage of moonwalks, you begin to watch closely and realize that these are ordinary movie tricks. For example, when I looked at the docking of the spacecraft in lunar orbit, how Apollo docked with the lunar module, I increased the brightness in Photoshop and saw masks there. In other words, this photograph is composed of two merged images. The same goes for a very famous photograph. It shows an astronaut with the Earth above. If you increase the brightness in Photoshop, 
as mentioned even in the Wikipedia article on the moon landing conspiracy, you can see some black contours. No one knows what they are. Some say they are shadows. But I'm telling you, my friends, I will tell you what they are. It's a movie trick called a mask. It's the border of the mask. The photograph is made from two shots, one shot and the other shot, and they are superimposed on each other. And when you increase the brightness, you can see the border of these two masks. The astronaut was filmed against a black background, while the flag and the earth were filmed on another movie screen made of scotch light. That's why it has strong halos. So, this picture of the moonwalk is just a cheap composite shot. There's nothing genuine or serious about it. Just ordinary movie tricks. What's next? Dimitri M. You raised your hand. Dimitri M. Try asking your question. I have turned on your microphone. Dimitri M. Greetings to all the participants of the broadcast. Greetings to the esteemed speaker. I have a question. We have all seen how in one of the Apollo missions, I think Apollo 17, the so-called astronauts ride on the moon surface on a lunar roving vehicle, and they play, jump, fall, and somersault. In general, there is some kind of wild celebration happening. Is it possible to do such things when you are in an absolutely hostile environment for humans? God forbid the spacesuit gets punctured by a rock. How is that possible? What does the esteemed speaker think about this? Thank you. In order to entertain the audience with something new, because viewers had stopped watching live broadcasts, the live broadcast of Apollo 11 lasted for two and a half hours. But if you look at what the audience saw, most of the time there was this image, some blurry white spot, and it dragged on there for about 15 minutes. It's very difficult to watch a blurry, shaky spot for 15 minutes. It was still a novelty in Apollo 11. But then the audience became less interested, and the scriptwriters came up with a trick. Let's make joyrides on the rover, the electric vehicle, starting from Apollo 15. If we look at the wide shots where this electric vehicle is visible, I can tell you with absolute certainty that if you look closely, it's a doll. Sometimes they show this rover up close, part of the wheel, and the astronaut walks around it. It's a full-sized model. But showing a moving rover in a wide shot is impossible. Why? First, imagine an entire stadium that needs to be illuminated by a single light source. We don't have such super-duper powerful light sources. Imagine trying to illuminate a whole stadium with just one spotlight, it won't work. So, they came up with an idea. Let's create a small studio, 20 to 30 meters wide. Let's take small toy models of these rovers. And that's why all these joy rides on the electric vehicle, on the rover, if it's a wide shot, it's either a doll or some mannequin. And if it's an actor walking in the video, usually you won't see the entire rover, only a part of it. Or they walk around it, but the rover never moves. If you look at the most famous shot of Apollo 16 ride, then if there had been a living person there, they could have shown him sitting in the rover, waving his hand. But there was a doll sitting there, and the whole time its left hand was hanging motionless in a bent position.
So, there were no real drives, of course. Interestingly, during the rehearsals on Earth, the left hand was always resting on the knee. But they made a doll so that the hand would move somehow. The doll is rocking on the console. There was nothing real or genuine there. And the jumps, leaps were solely for one purpose. To convince the viewers that everything supposedly happened on the moon, the filmmakers used a simple technique. Since the free-fall acceleration on the moon is one-sixth of that on Earth, it can be simulated in a simple way. The square root of 6 is 2.5, or more precisely, 2.46. So, one had to film at a speed 2.5 times faster, 60 frames per second, and then play it back at the normal speed of 24 frames per second. This resulted in filming at an accelerated speed, and all the astronauts move slowly in such weak gravity. They specifically asked the actors to kick up as much sand as possible. Because flying sand falls slowly and creates the illusion that the astronauts are on the moon. That's why they specifically ask the actors to jump as much as possible, throw rocks, and even drop expensive million-dollar instruments. So, if you watch Apollo 16, their hammers are falling. They took some scientific instrument and bam, hit it on the surface, kicked it with their feet. All was designed for a television presentation. After all, no one could have predicted that 30 to 40 years later, the internet would appear and every frame could be paused. That's why they didn't particularly bother. And to make it more interesting for the viewers, they came up with various jumps, leaps and so on. Therefore, let's recall how one astronaut on the International Space Station once thought that air was leaking from his spacesuit. It caused him nervous stress. But here, it's clear that everything is filmed in a studio, so nobody was particularly concerned. Of course, the large filming crew that was capturing it all didn't fully understand the extent of the danger involved. You see, the concept of what a spacesuit should be like, how people should move, all of it was naive. As a result, Everything turned out to be naive, without adhering to safety protocols. If you look at the early Mercury missions, there was also no safety equipment. It was like a circus act. The capsule crossed the boundary of space, the Kármán line, and splashed down into the ocean as if it came from outer space. The astronaut opens the hatch and comes out amidst the rolling waves. Now, when an American spacecraft splashes down, nobody opens the hatch in the ocean. It's first towed to the ship for 40 minutes, secured, and then the hatch is opened. And when we watch the missions of Alan Shepard or Gus Grissom, they again show some circus acts. They hang on some sort of harness called a horse collar fastened under their shoulders. They are lifted by a helicopter on a rope and pulled up. These are circus acts. That's why I think that during those years in the 1960s, there was a very weak understanding of safety procedures, so they came up with all sorts of stunts. And if you look at other missions, like Gemini, you'll see the same circus acts. The Americans thought it was normal. Like when two spacecraft dock, an astronaut would come out of one ship and throw a lasso onto the other ship to pull it closer. They had common notions about this. Make sense? Completely detached from reality. So, the falling, jumping, of course. Now we all understand that it should never be done. And nobody would do it on the real moon. It was done by filmmakers. They have a completely different concept. 
After all, the entire Hollywood Dream Factory works like this. If you watch movies with Schwarzenegger, everything is entirely unrealistic. A high voltage mast falls on Schwarzenegger's head, and he shakes it off and keeps going. What is that? Or they shoot from a pistol, and the bullets never run out. It's just the ideology of filmmaking based on such ideas. And they transferred all of that to the space film shooting. That's my opinion. Let's move on to another question. Thank you, Dimitri. Just one request from me. Keep the question and answer short because we need to end the broadcast to prepare for another one that I will have at 10 o'clock. Friend Zaitsev, let's hear your question. Hello, esteemed speaker. I have a question. In the whole scheme of things that you describe, where Americans didn't go to the moon, how, from your point of view, was it possible to ensure silence from people who dislike America? Even if we assume that the USSR made an agreement with the USA about it, there's still China and many other countries that are not fond of the USA. How could a global conspiracy of silence be achieved? I think it's elementary. For example, it's similar to the COVID story. We received an order from the World Health Organization in New York. We replied, yes, sir, we will comply, because we signed an agreement stating that we are part of the World Health Organization and will follow all their orders. The same goes for other areas. All our television is controlled. There's an interview with the head of Russia today. A woman, whose name I forgot, Kiyosayan's wife. Margarita Simonyan. Margarita Simonyan says, you see, just poke at any head of our television channels. They all went through American schools, either Yale University or something else. So, they have been influenced by America. Moreover, until recently, all mass media in America belonged to six families. Six people can agree on what to publish and what not to publish, can't they? Even now, you can't write the truth in Wikipedia about the special military operation. Wikipedia is pro-American, and there are curators there. And as soon as you write some truth, they immediately delete it. I tried to write in Wikipedia that this photo is a collage of two images. My information lasted on the website for 30 minutes. I waited and wrote again a few days later. It was deleted after an hour. People are vigilant there. The thing is, until we cancel Article 15.04 of the Constitution and Article 13.02, Article 15 about the priority of international laws over Russian laws and our obligation to comply with all orders from foreign courts and organizations, the situation won't change. Our television will still be controlled by foreign companies. For example, our television is managed by the rating company TNS, Taylor Nelson Safrez. They decide which shows should be shown, what you should show on NTV, and then they will give you high ratings, advertisements, and movies. I couldn't understand before, why on Saturdays and Sundays when the whole family gathers, NTV shows films about maniacs, murderers, some prostitutes, and corrupt policemen. It's because, unfortunately, our organizations are controlled by completely different people. Five major foreign companies control our economy and ministries. When you are near Beloruskaya subway station, look next to the church, there's a black high riser. It used to have a name PWC, Price Waterhouse Cooper. That's the company that gives orders to our ministries on how to act, but now it has been renamed. Since you asked to be brief, I want to say that, unfortunately, many of our mass media outlets are under foreign control.
Currently, we lack sufficient sovereignty to express our own point of view. I have just read an interview. Maria Shukshina expresses her outrage. How long will we continue to air all these talk shows where they dig into dirty laundry? We need to shut it all down. We need to air educational shows, as it used to be, like the series, I want to know everything. But, alas, we receive the orders from above. And for now we obey foreign consultants. Everyone understands this, but they can't do anything because control is not in their hands. They can't freely speak up. Someone tried to tell the truth, and they were told, where is your money? In which bank is it kept? In America. That's it. Do you want us to freeze it? And that's it. Right away the president of Kazakhstan became obedient. He started doing what the Americans told him. See? So everywhere. Dmitry Rogozin gave a big interview and talked about how the fraternization with Americans started during Gorbachev's time. That's because many of our cosmonauts or business figures have businesses in America. Their children study in France or elsewhere abroad. They will never say anything bad about America. Never speak the truth because they are deeply interested in their business or other matters. There are few independent networks. That's why occasionally, from time to time, on the channel Zvezda in 2016, we made The Great U.S. Space Secret. On TV Center and REN TV we made shows about the moon hoax where I also participated. But on Channel 1 it's forbidden to talk about all this. Despite some pro-Russian shows, in general, it's an anti-Russian channel. It always propagates that everything is bad in Russia promotes negative things, digs into dirty laundry, and so on. Well, that's how I can answer. Um, Leonid, thank you very much. We had Leonid Konovalov on the air, a graduate of Geek, a cinematographer, a professor at Geek, and a specialist in the NASA Apollo program. Thank you very much, Leonid. And thank you to our viewers. Goodbye to everyone. Goodbye.